What exactly is a drone? Some will tell you a drone is a surveillance tool meant to watch over a nation. Others might say it's an innovative gizmo for delivering products. Even more probably will tell you a drone is a lethal ghost hiding in the sky. The United States military currently has hundreds of unarmed and armed drones flying over more than a dozen countries. By 2018, the Federal Aviation Administration predicts some 7,500 small commercial drones will be present in the United States alone. In the past decade, drones have become synonymous with airstrikes aimed at eliminating terrorist groups overseas, guided largely by the Central Intelligence Agency's targeted killing program. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism reports that between 2004 and 2014, the CIA organized close to 400 drone strikes in Pakistan, killing more than 3,000 people. And those are just the strikes we know about. It's no wonder these machines have captured the curiosity and fear of the world over. But where did these phantoms of the sky come from? To find out, we'll need to look back almost 100 years. Drones, or unmanned aerial vehicles, work through a system of sensors. Think of it as a basic remote-controlled vehicle, only with a much longer range. The exact origin of the drone is tricky to pin down. World War I saw the first real introduction of aircraft into military service, though things like balloons and kites had been used for decades before. Toward the end of World War I, the U.S. Army was working on what it called aerial torpedoes, small biplanes like the Kettering Bug that would essentially work as kamikaze drones. But the war ended before they could be used. In 1915, in the early months of the Battle of Nova Chapelle in France, British armed forces used aerial imagery to capture more than 1,500 skyview maps of the German trench fortifications in the region. This ushered in a brand new era of using aerial imagery for complex coordinated operations like, for the first time ever, artillery on the ground were able to carry out barrages with advanced knowledge of the enemy infantry thanks to aerial mapping. This system continued to develop throughout the war. In 1939, in the very early stages of World War II, the United States produced the first remote-controlled aircraft called the Radio Plane OQ-2. Norma Jean Doherty, before she became better known as Marilyn Monroe, worked at a California plant assembling OQ-2s during the war. Unmanned surveillance operations continued playing more prominent roles throughout the Cold War and global conflicts in general. In 1973, after the Yom Kippur War, Israel developed the Mastiff UAV, and soon after, the IAI Scout, again both unpiloted surveillance machines. In 1986, a joint U.S.-Israeli project produced the RQ-2 Pioneer, a medium-sized reconnaissance drone. Around the same time, Abraham Karam, an Israeli expert engineer who'd spent years working for the IAI, developed a similar prototype called the Nat 750 in his garage outside Los Angeles. American defense contractor General Tomix bought Karam's design in 1990. Fast forward a few years to the early stages of the Bosnian War, and the CIA purchased two Nat 750s for $5 million to deploy on surveillance operations over Bosnia. On January 7, 1994, the Pentagon signed a contract with General Tomix that tasked the company with redesigning the Nat 750, a deal to make it bigger, sturdier, quieter, more dynamic. Six months later, the first generation of the Predator drone was born. The Predator was first flown over Afghanistan in the fall of 2000, when an Air Force team flew one for the CIA in a hunt for Osama bin Laden. At the time, it was only armed with surveillance cameras. On December 21, 2000, the U.S. Air Force received Pentagon approval to arm the Predator with Hellfire missiles, less than a year before the 9-11 terrorist attacks on New York City. In the immediate aftermath of 9-11, the CIA launched the Targeted Killing Campaign, essentially an approval list from the Pentagon to kill whomever they deemed perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks. This is legal because of what's called an authorization for use of military force, a law Congress passed in the wake of 9-11. Enter the strikes. As the remnants of the terror group Al-Qaeda's leadership fled out of Afghanistan and into Pakistan and Yemen, both sovereign territories, the newly armed drones soon followed, quietly. And here's where things really started to get messy. Article 2.4 of the Charter of the United Nations protects the sovereignty of member states, meaning they should be free from military incursions during times of peace. But the Obama administration argued the manhunts were permissible because the intended targets, all affiliated with Al-Qaeda in one form or another, posed an imminent threat 
of attacks on U.S. soil or U.S. interests abroad. Both the CIA and Pentagon have been relatively quiet about who and where they strike. The Bureau of Investigative Journalism reports that the CIA initiated close to 400 drone strikes in Pakistan since 2004, while the Pentagon executed between 66 and 184 in Yemen, plus 20 more in Somalia. But really, given the limited information on strikes, it's difficult to pin down an exact number of casualties. Why use drones to kill? Why now? Think about it as if you're cracking a code. In traditional warfare, enemies were easily identified by their uniforms or activities. Post-9-11 terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and related insurgencies instead hide in plain sight, living modestly amongst civilians and using homes as their command centers. The sneakiness of drones makes it possible for someone near Las Vegas to remotely watch over a suspected area in, say, Pakistan for months at a time, sifting through the haystack to find the hiding needle from an entire ocean away. But that just leads to things getting even messier. As with traditional strikes, civilians can also get caught up in the crossfire from drones. The Bureau reports 957 civilians have been killed by drone strikes in Pakistan since 2004. 200 of them children. But again, exact numbers are tough to nail down. On September 30th, 2011, the CIA killed Anwar al-Laki, a U.S. citizen living in Yemen who'd been working for al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a radical militant group. Some law scholars and journalists criticized the Obama administration for targeting an American citizen. But the U.S. Department of Justice insisted al-Laki had for years posed imminent threats to the United States. The ethics and laws of it all are still largely a very gray area. In 2014, Amazon proposed using drones, much smaller and simpler than those in the military, to deliver packages to customers. Real estate agencies have begun using drones for promotional videos, and a burst of small DIY organizations have started creating their own smaller scale machines for recreational flights. Others have used drones for anti-poaching rescue missions in Africa. Medicine delivery via drones is still in its testing phase, and even Facebook is building huge solar-powered drones to fly at 50,000 feet and beam internet into remote areas of the world. The Federal Aviation Administration reports more than 934 government agencies in the United States, from the FBI to Customs and Border Control to small police departments in Minnesota, have been approved for limited rights to operate unmanned aircraft in domestic spaces. Chris Anderson, former editor at Wired who left the magazine to run 3D Robotics, a drone kit company, put it best. We are entering the drone age. There's been blowback. As of May 2014, 35 states in the U.S. have introduced legislation to limit the use of drones by government agencies. To date, 12 have adopted this legislation. Ironically, though, recent polls show that more than half of Americans approve the use of drone strikes. Overseas, understandably, the overall approval is much lower. If the drone age is indeed here, what can we expect in the next year? Two years? Five? If recent trends are any indication, we might as well get used to seeing them. And having them see us.